So the other day, I just realized that I've been making videos about language learning on YouTube for over 10 years. Hundreds of millions of views, almost half a million subscribers here, all wanting to learn languages. And so I thought it would be fun to go back over the last 10 years and pick out the very best language learning tips from this whole period. These are the language learning ideas, philosophy, strategies that I would want to take with me out of a burning building. If I was gonna start a new language today, this is what I would want to know. So whether you're just starting to learn a new language or you're a seasoned polyglot, there will be some gold in here for you. Let me know which you like in the comments and let's get into it. To knuckle down, focus and concentrate on one thing at a time because focus is the key to learning languages. And that's the genius of the hoarding villain. He knows that getting you to hoard more and more language resources is a guaranteed way to kill your language dreams forever. He's evil and he must be stopped. That stop him you can. And there is one simple change you can make to banish him into the ether forever. Whatever stage of language learning you're at right now, beginner or advanced, there's one thing you could do promptly to improve your language skills. So let's do this together right now. We're gonna do this right now, okay? So what I want you to do right now is to take down one language book from your shelf or one, one course, whatever it may be. Something that you're currently working on or one that you feel like is the best fit for you right now. And then I want you to hide everything else. Literally take all your other books, CDs, whatever, put them in a box, seal it shut, whatever it takes. And then that one book or resource that you've chosen, you're simply gonna work through it from beginning to end. And then don't open that box of other stuff until you've reached the end of the book or the course that you've chosen. Because when there is no hoard of books to jump around on, the hoarding villain can't get to you. Nothing you can do because you've only got one thing that you're allowed to work on. And if you do this, a few magic things are gonna happen. You're gonna start being focused like a laser. You'll get the full benefit of that one resource that you've chosen. And you'll go much deeper than you would if you were just jumping from one thing to the next. Focus and persistence on one thing. For this reason, I designed the story learning method to be built around a story because then the job of focusing becomes super easy for you. Your main job is simply to make it to the end of the story and then the learning takes care of itself. The time off actually allows you to kind of just take stock of the way that you study, identify these bad habits, that might have crept into to the way that you've been learning. And it's an opportunity for you to say, right, let's try things a bit differently. Also, when you're away, inevitably you think about these things and you, and you think about, you know, how should I be using my time? And that just, it's an opportunity to think and reflect. To me, it makes perfect sense that if you've been studying something for, for a few months and a couple of weeks off, when you look at it in the in the grander scheme of things, is only going to be beneficial. Like I said, I've noticed this lots of times before when I've been studying a language quite intensively. Sometimes you step away for a month, and then you have an opportunity to speak the language maybe after after that month or so, and everything's just so easy because your brain's hard at work in the background, making connections, making sense of stuff. So. I say I'm all for breaks. I'm all for taking time off. I think apart from anything, it's your life that you're dealing with. You've got to live your life and we can't just be permanently on call, permanently you know, working, plugging away at things. We've got to take time off. In my case, what happened was I'd been studying Cantonese for quite a few months and then I took a few weeks off and did nothing. But it was the opposite of nothing. I went and studied another language. The effect of that was I kind of, I kind of came back and my speaking ability was like double what it was before. If you study every day during the week, could you take a, a couple of days off? If you've been studying for months nonstop, what happens if you just take a month off? What's the worst that can happen? In fact, I'd probably rephrase that and say, what are the potential upsides, the potential benefits. And if you're someone that doesn't like to chill out, if you're someone that doesn't like to take breaks, taking a break of this kind could be uh, an incredibly powerful thing to do. As difficult as it may seem at first sight, learning an alphabet with less than 50, 50 letters in is not really that hard. It's the kind of thing you can do in a weekend if you really want to. And you know, you can look for all these crazy tricks and methods for remembering them. But really, when I've learned different alphabets in the past, I found that the only way, that like by far, the most effective, simple way of doing it is to simply sit down. I like say to yourself, right, I'm gonna sit down and learn this alphabet now, and I'm not gonna get up until I've learned it. And what you'll find is an, Arabic, an alphabet like Arabic, for example, you can learn it in a few hours. Each Arabic letter has four similar forms when they come in different positions in the word. Separate, beginning, middle, and end. Ba, ba, ta, te, fa, fa. Now you might not be able to write it very, very beautifully, um, and you might not be able to 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 read everything instantly. 
but you can learn the basic the basics of an alphabet like like Arabic within a, a few hours and certainly within a few days. And the quickest way to end the frustration and get the regular practice you need to start speaking your language well is to go out and find a bunch of speaking partners, teachers, whoever it may be that you can meet with regularly and who turn up to meet you with the express intention of giving you your vitally important speaking practice without feeling like you're taking advantage of a friendship. Now, the psychological trap, I think, is that feeling that it's logical for your friends to be the ones that you should practice speaking with because they're the ones who are close to you, they're the people that you know. You know why does it make sense to go out and find new people, you think? But it's precisely because you need to interact with these people a lot and regularly that you need to leave your friendships out of it. And yes, this means you need to get out of your comfort zone, get out there, meet new people. But it's easily done these days thanks to websites like conversationexchange.com or apps like Tandem. So go out there and make it happen. Take responsibility for your speaking practice and keep going until you get your language level to a point where you can go and hold a genuine conversation with your friends and colleagues in their language. If there's been any language advice you've had for me that's really helped you in your own language learning from this video or elsewhere on the channel, I'd love to know what it is in the comments. Please let me know. And if for some reason you're still not subscribed to the channel, well, hit that subscribe button because that really helps to show your support. Real language spoken in the real world is nothing like your textbook. Textbook language is, is simplified for one and language audios are spoken by voice actors slowly and articulately so that you'll hear every syllable. Now, perfectly reasonable for a language course, but in real life, people speak differently. Let's try something here. Now, you see this sentence on the screen? Try saying this now out loud in the way that it might be read in a textbook, for example, despite the fact that he arrived sooner. Now try saying it at a normal conversational speed, despite the fact that he arrived sooner. You hear the difference between those two? Take a second to think about all the different sounds and the things that change in this sentence when we say it naturally, despite the fact that he arrived sooner, despite the fact that he arrived sooner. Can you hear everything that changes? See, we tend to join sounds together, kind of like a slur between words and even twist those sounds into something new altogether. Make sense? This is known in linguistics as connected speech, and you may have no idea that you do this even in your own language. If the material is at your level, very important, and you have a transcription in front of you, also very important, then you can keep listening to the audio at full speed with all the support that you need. And then just like magic, with time, you'll be listening to native speakers chatting away and you'll realize that you understand what they're saying. And when you've actually experienced this feeling of, wow, I can actually follow along now at full speed. Once you've actually had that experience in a language, you will never want to go back to listening to unnaturally slow audio again. The real question is that if you, you know, if you add that second language into the mix, then you're going to just do everything less efficiently. And for me, that's a problem because I would much rather spend my time focusing on one language and make fast progress in that one language. That's going to get me get me further, faster. The implication of that is that you know, if you do want to learn two languages, it's probably much better to learn one language first and then later on, call it a day and move on to a second language. You're going to be able to focus on a much deeper level with both of those languages. If you're one of those people and you want to learn two languages at once, then there is uh, one piece of advice that I think is going to be really helpful for you, which is to, as far as possible, and as far as it makes sense for you, to choose two languages from different language families. If you're trying to learn Spanish and Italian, for example, um, at the same time, you're going to get confused because they're too similar. And you're, you're, the lack of a distinction between the languages is going to mean that you, uh, you just get confused and you can't clearly delineate things like uh, verb conjugations uh, in your head. Um, it would be much more effective and much easier for you to learn, say, uh, Spanish and uh, Japanese or Italian and Chinese, two languages from a completely different background, because then you're just going to be able to much more easily compartmentalize them in your head. The best time to learn a particular grammar point, you see, is not when it comes up in your textbook. The absolute best, most helpful, most awesome time to learn a bit of grammar is when you've just been into a cafe and you tried to order something using a phrase you've learned, but something wasn't quite right and the guy understood you, but the message didn't get across quite right and you thought it was right, but it wasn't quite and something, something wasn't completely clear. And the reason why is because you were missing a helpful 
bit of grammar, a little twist that would have expressed what you wanted to say with perfect clarity. That piece of grammar right there, well, that's something that you're ready to learn right now. You're ready for it. You were very close to getting it right, and it's just that little bit of grammar that scuppered you. See, that right there, that's when you want to learn a piece of grammar. But the relentless focus on grammar that you see in virtually every language curriculum, it does something poisonous. It instills in students the belief that they can't start speaking or using the language yet until they've learnt all the grammar. Can you imagine applying that logic to the piano? I'm only going to start playing the piano once I've mastered music theory. You'd never get anywhere, you'd give up before you started. We need a completely different approach to teaching grammar that is smarter than simply presenting a humongous list of rules and tenses and things that have to be learned. Do yourself a favour, put the textbooks away, get out there and speak, and don't learn grammar before you really, really need it. Stories are exactly how we teach languages here at Story Learning. If you've never looked into it, you really should. Learning with stories is a whole new way of learning languages, and we've taught tens of thousands of students a new language using this method. It works because when you learn a language with stories, not rules, the language just sticks in your head more easily, which means you learn faster and with less stress. Anyway, if you're keen to see how it all works, you can get a free tour of the method. Just look for my story learning kit in the video description below. There's a link to click it, completely free. It will take you to the right place. Words very rarely exist in isolation. Some words do. I mean, the word book, for example, or, or the word table. Well, those are quite descriptive and you won't get into too much trouble using those words. But there are tons and tons of words in any language which are actually used fairly infrequently. And whenever they are used, it's always within a particular phrase or variation of a phrase. In fact, if you looked back at all the stuff you say over the course of a normal day, you would be absolutely amazed how few decisions you actually had to make about the words that you used and the words that you chose. You see, a staggering number of things that we say are not cleverly concocted in the moment. We don't construct the grammar as we go cleverly choosing our prepositions and verb tenses to conform to the rules in English. We might like to think that we do. And if you're a teacher, you might like to pretend to your students that all your perfect grammar is down to your personal genius. But in reality, a huge amount of what we say is nothing more than a bunch of phrases we've used thousands of times in the past, adapted a bit to fit the situation. Actually, you can apply this technique of learning chunks or phrases to everything that you do. I've been through entire periods in my language learning when all I learn is phrases. No single words, just phrases. I pick phrases out of the material that I'm reading or listening to, I put them into flashcards, and I learn them. That's right, I would actually memorize whole sets of phrases, and I promise you it's far easier than you think. Most importantly though, it has an immediate impact on your speaking, because you are now no longer thinking in single words, but rather in phrases. And what does it mean if you think in phrases? It means that you start to speak in phrases, longer, more flowing phrases, and you sound a lot more fluent. So it's win-win. This is where the idea of quantity over quality comes in. If you focus on quality, meaning like intensive, deliberate study, what happens is that you're kind of engaging your gray matter, maybe, but that doesn't help you. There's a very, very thin link between that and actually remembering or acquiring what you're studying, okay? But by having an approach that, so, that focuses on quantity, in other words, you see these words and phrases and grammar, whatever it is, many, many times over, you give your brain the opportunity to remember it naturally, which is a lot more fun, it's a lot more effective, but also it means that you can cover a lot more ground. As you get more advanced in a language, that starts to reverse. Because as you reach higher levels, then you kind of get into a quality over quantity situation. Because the amount of unknown material in the language then is starting to reduce. And so the way that you can keep progressing is by understanding those those more intricate grammar points, for example, or learning your, you know, the, the la some of the more academic or specific topic, spe subject specific vocabulary in a language. That's where you are going to have to take a more academic approach to doing it. Do you ever find that when you're speaking a foreign language, you get fatigued, you get tired, you maybe you're your brain starts to hurt, your head starts to pound after a while of speaking. <laughs> so if you find that you are getting tired after like 30 minutes of speaking English, the only thing you need to do is to push yourself further. That means trying to speak for two hours or three hours, finding situations where you can do that. You will 
suffer probably <laughs> at the beginning, but that's the way that you build up your tolerance and your stamina for the language. It really is as simple as that. You know, you're doing a great job by already speaking the language, that's great. Now it's just a question of keep going, press on and get yourself that, that practice and very quickly, you know, you won't find yourself getting so tired. In most situations when you're abroad, it's pretty hard to get extended periods of language practice, right? Most people on the street are not gonna stop and talk to you for, you know, for five, 10 minutes, even one minute, it can be hard, right? Most of the time, the people that you speak to are gonna be people in shops and, and things like that. People who you have some kind of transactional reason to, uh, to talk to. Now, I guess a hairdresser is also a transactional type of thing. The difference is that it takes a lot longer. The thing about that period of time is you are forced to speak the language that whole time. Force might seem like a strong word, but you've kind of got this social contract going on when you're getting your hair cut, which is that the hairdresser uh, feels obliged to, to speak to you and to ask you questions and, and to make conversation. And you feel obliged to, uh, to to reply, even if it's in a language you're not particularly comfortable with or you know, you're in the, in the middle of learning. If you are there kind of face to face with someone who's doing something for you, like cutting your hair, you know, you feel pretty rude not making every bit of effort you can to actually interact and um, and and talk to the person. What happens is you go through this very interesting kind of um, journey over the course of that time. The first 10, 15 minutes or so can be uh, a little bit tough. You're kind of finding your ground, you're, you're, you're getting used to speaking the language, and then you kind of settle into a bit of a routine and then a bit of a rhythm. And then after half an hour or so, what, what, what can happen is the kind of tiredness can set in. So you suddenly get really tired. Oh man, I can't talk anymore. My, my, head is, my, head, my head feels like it's going to explode. You kind of reach this pain threshold of speaking the language, which if you've ever spoken your target language for you know, extended periods of time, you know what I'm talking about, right? So like your brain just can't handle anymore. But a strange thing seems to happen after whenever that kind of pain threshold gets reached, which is when you come out the other side, it's like you've shaken it all off and you've just kind of really found your rhythm with the language. You're just kind of speaking it without thinking. It's almost as if like you have got used to the pain and the tiredness and you, you just don't care anymore. So you just, you just talk. Whenever I've got my hair cut in different countries, I've been through this similar experience where beginning is kind of a little bit painful and then you kind of pass the, 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 the pain threshold, the tiredness barrier. By the time you come out, you've actually spent an hour at least or more in there speaking in the language. It's a very special situation when you've got someone who will actually just be there and make conversation with you. It's to look for opportunities like the haircut situation where you can engage in an activity where the language itself is not the point, where speaking the language or being judged on your language ability is not the purpose of that activity. But when you get your haircut, the language is not the focus. The focus is on actually communicating and speaking with the guy or the girl. Like that, there are many other similar situations that you might be able to put yourself in. Can you take salsa classes like I did in Japan, in Japanese? Can you go and do yoga classes? Can you sign up to, I don't know, can you take a course of some kind or an evening class that's conducted in the language that you're learning? Anything like this where you are put into contact with other people who you can then speak with independently of being judged on your language level, where, you, where your, your mutual focus is on something else that not only gives you a chance to speak the language, but to also bond with them socially because you, again, you've got this shared experience which has nothing to do with the language. I started to do something very simple, which was to add a 15 minute session to the end of my day. I like to study in the morning, right? It's where I'm most fresh, where I can guarantee I've got the time for learning. So what I would do for a while is just study in the morning and then go off and get on with my day and come back the next morning. But when I added a 15 minute review section at the end of my day, I found that I'd started retaining huge amounts more than I did um, without it. And in that review session, all I would do is kind of go back and look at what I was studying in the morning. That might be recapping some of the vocabulary, listening to the dialogue I was studying a few times, rereading passages from the dialogue, whatever it may be. But it's the act of coming back and looking again at something that you've already studied really reinforces it. The more times that your brain comes back to something, the more, the higher chance, the higher likelihood it has of actually remembering it. You can do some writing using what you've learned. You can talk to yourself in the shower using as many new words as you can. Or, or my personal favorite, what I tend to do these days, just go back and read and reread earlier chapters from uh, from the book, whatever book 
you're reading. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that you deliberately review what you've learned. You'll find new vocabulary sticking in your mind far more reliably than before, so you can feel a sense of uh, progress and satisfaction in your learning. Now, let me give you one very simple way to take action on this right now. What I want you to do is add one very simple step to your daily routine. At the end of every day, I want you to sit down for 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, and look over the last thing or set of things that you have studied. You don't need to write anything, you don't need to study anything, just take 10 minutes to look back over whatever it is that you've done recently with your languages, uh, your vocabulary notes, uh, a chapter from a book that you've just read, the audio from the most recent dialogue that you've been going through in, in, your, in your course. Just add these little 10 minutes into your study routine and you'll be amazed at how you retain stuff uh, more easily. Once you've said something a few times in real conversation, having studied it before or read it before, you're much more likely to then remember it for the long term because you've used it for real communication. That is the polyglot equivalent of personalization in the language teaching world. And you could be forgiven for saying that this is rather obvious. And if you did think that, well, like many of these rules of language learning, you would be right. But like I always say, simple is best. Simple always makes it easy to remember. And I like that. When you're honest with yourself about the main reason you're trying to learn a language, when it starts to get tough, when the kind of honeymoon period is over and you're really knuckling down and studying every day, trying to you know, get this language around your head, it's that motivation, that deep reason that you've got for learning that's gonna keep you getting up in the morning, keep you working on it and keep you, keep you motivated. This reason is gonna be different for you than it is for me, than it is for everybody else. Um, you know, you may have a, a, a husband or wife whose language you want to learn. You may be worried about your kids and you may want to make sure that you learn a language for the sake of your kids. You may have retired to the south of France and you want to integrate with the local villagers. You might want to get a promotion that you need to speak Chinese for. There's all kinds of reasons, but whatever it is, take a second to just think honestly for yourself, what is your primary motivation? Write it down somewhere, like etch it somehow in your brain. Because if you can keep that real in your head and you can keep that vision alive, you will keep the motivation you need to keep going. The only step you have to do after that is to make sure that you you base your studying around those things. So you, you make sure that you, know, you don't just study a certain book or course because someone said it was good. You do it because it meets your, your goals. Mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, are how we learn. Via negativa. We know what is wrong with more clarity than what is right. Knowledge grows by subtraction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet, when we're learning a foreign language, we spend so much of our time trying to avoid making mistakes. Mistakes are bad, they say. Well, mistakes are bad, aren't they? Isn't the word itself a negative, something to be avoided? Whether it's the correct verb conjugation you're looking for, the perfect pronunciation for that difficult word you're trying to remember, or in my case, using completely the wrong word and making people's dinner go cold. We see our mistakes as a source of embarrassment, annoyance, despair. A lot of people I meet even talk about giving up their language studies because they're still making mistakes. See, I say it's time to rethink mistakes. I say it's time to recognize mistakes for what they are. Mistakes are actually the way we learn. That's right. How else do you think we ever gain confidence in our languages if we don't go up and go out and mess up from time to time? But you have to mess things up, you have to. You have to get it wrong and screw up. Mistakes and learning from mistakes are how you gain the confidence to know when you get it right. So it's time to reframe how we think about mistakes, not as a big negative that we, that we have to learn to live with, rather that we should relish making mistakes and actually look forward to making them, even going out of our way sometimes to make mistakes putting ourselves out there as much as possible so that mistakes can be made and lessons can be learned. I know it sounds crazy, but really, this is just a decision of deciding not to react to the mental panic of making mistakes that's been programmed into us by years of formal lessons and memories of school. Draw power and courage from your mistakes. You will be happier for it. The secret to learning languages when you're busy is to take advantage of every small break and little bit of time that you have throughout the day. You may not always have an hour long block free every night, but you do always have five or 10 minutes here or there. You learn to pounce on these short chunks of time and use them for something productive. 
then you'll find yourself making lots of progress right away. I think the most, the, the biggest danger for, for everyone in language learning is that you come up with excuses or, or come up, invent reasons why you can't do something or you, you, you spend so much time planning and preparing to study that you don't actually sit down and do the work at all. I would much rather that you spend 10 minutes every single day doing one thing than work out some big plan to study for two or three hours a day. I really don't think it's necessary to spend hours every day studying. I mean, it's great if you can, but it's not necessary. The point here is that you can do great things with 15 minutes a day, but only if that's 15 minutes a day, every single day, without taking any days off or, or very rarely taking any days off. However much you're doing, however much you're studying, just keep going. I'm gonna say it one more time. Just keep going. I'm not gonna tell you what the best way to learn a language is, but I'll certainly tell you what the best way to not learn a language is, and that's by giving up. Have faith, dig in, keep going, and good luck. If you devote your life to language learning and you study languages regularly, then lots of great things happen, but not least inside your brain. And in this video over here, I will show you how it is that your brain changes and develops over time as you dedicate yourself to learning languages. So go and check that out right now.